Assalamu alaikum and greetings one and all. This is part two of our series on the discussion around zakah, its principles and the practices with our guest in the studio, Maulana Muhammad Kaur. Um, so stay tuned as we'll be looking at some practical examples of zakah and the types of assets that one has to consider right after this. Our guest in the studio, Mona Muhammad Kaur, one of the board members of the Sharia Advisory Board with Kamisa Asset Management. And we are continuing in part two of our discussion on zakah. Assalamu alaikum, Mona. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Welcome back, and we're continuing our discussion on zakah, uh, very pertinent and one of the arkans of Islam. And for our Muslim viewers and subscribers, uh, quite quite an important discussion that we're having to create awareness around this this topic. Um, in the previous in the previous episode, we discussed on the basic principles of zakah, and just to pick up where we left off, where we we initially spoke about misal, I think uh, then to look at ownership of assets, um, and perhaps one can look at pension funds in that regard because it's not you own it but you not necessarily have access to it mm. during your working career mm. and then also looking at assets um, that have growth and assets that don't grow necessarily mm. so we can start with them on an actual thank you once again for the opportunity and uh, we had looked at certain assets are subject to zakat yes and once you've ascertained that I need to pay my zakah on them, there are certain conditions which apply. The one would be, you must have the minimum taxable amount. And number two is that asset class must remain with you for an entire lunar year. And as you mentioned, you must be the owner of it. It seems to be obvious that um, if you own a hundred thousand rands, then I can't be liable to pay the zakah on your hundred thousand rands. So it seems almost like something obvious, but uh, there are different types of ownerships, and mm -hmm. like you alluded to in terms of the examples. So we have examples of ownership, but your ownership may be complete, or your ownership may be incomplete. From an Islamic perspective, we consider your ownership to be complete when you own the asset, and number two is you have access to the asset as, as well. So in those particular instances and circumstances, there's no question. Mm -hmm. A normal investment would be of that nature, despite the fact that a sal there may be a surrender fee, but ultimately you own it and you have access to it. Yes. So in those particular instances, when these two conditions are met, you are the owner and you have access to it, there is no question in terms of the zakat. But in certain other instances, like you mentioned in terms of your, your pension fund, so in terms of the pension fund, you are the owner of the fund. But the important question would be, do you have access to the fund? Yes. So you don't have access to the fund until that fund matures or some contingent event happens and in terms of the Pension Fund Act or the investment uh, that you are subscribing to, they actually allow you access to it. Mm. So in short, in terms of the Pension Fund, you are the owner, but you don't have access to it. So since you don't have access to it, you're not liable to pay zakah um, uh, immediately. You're not liable to pay zakah immediately. Right? That's because um, you don't have access to it. Yes. The day that you gain access to it, in other words, when your pension fund matures, so normally what happens is that um, two thirds of your fund are invested in an annuity, either a life annuity or a living annuity. Okay. And that vehicle is basically going to generate income for you in your twilight years and your retirement years. Yes. And then the one third you can access if you want to for whatever reason you would want to. Yes. At that particular point, now not only are you the owner of the fund in terms of the asset, in terms of the money, yes. but you have access to it as well. Correct. So now there's full ownership. Yes. And at that particular point in time, now you're liable to pay Zagar. Yes. Now, strictly speaking, according to the Shafi mother, uh, you're now liable to pay Zagar. Shafi jurors are going to ask the question, look, all along, have you been the owner? You say, yes, it's my pension fund, I've been the owner. Okay, you weren't allowed access, but now you have access. Yes. So since you have access now, you were the owner all along, you're going to have to pay the Zakai in retrospect. Mm. 
So for the 20, 30 so for years? 20, 30 years, they're going to ask you to do that. So if you look at, at the Orthodox view and in terms of what is obligatory, not obligatory, it's very simple. Yes. Um, you and I, uh, in your 30s, in your 40s, your pension fund is only going to mature 20 years later. What is your obligation? What are you duty bound to do? You're not duty bound to do anything in terms of it being obligated. Why? Yes. Because you don't have access to it. Yes. At the same time also, and this is just a suggestion, at the same time, um, my understanding of the situation is that at the point of 60, 65, when the pension fund does mature, for a number of reasons, uh, cash flow being one of them, yes. uh, it may be more prudent for a person, despite the fact that it's not obligatory upon him, to rather pay the zakah on his pension fund annually. Mm. It's easier. And make provision for it. And make provision for it. Yeah. Um, I find that uh, uh, cash flow, from a practical point of view, when it comes to the disbursement of zakah, yes. um, uh, is an issue. Yes. Therefore, we find some businessmen who do the following, and it's completely uh, valid to do it. What they do is they have an estimation mm. in terms of the lunar year. That I'm going to have to pay an X amount of money, let's say 50,000 rands, in terms of the assets that I have, my business, in terms of the stock that I carry, and in terms of my, my bank balance. So, what they do is, the zakah is due the month of Ramadan coming. Yes. But what they do is, every month, at the end of every month, they, have, uh, they take out an X amount of money, let's say uh, 5,000 rands. And then they would dispense of that as a In other words, they forward pay the zakat. Yes. And one of the big driving factors in that would be that in Ramadan, if they were asked to pay the entire amount of lump sum, they, have, they would have cash flow issues. Mm. The cash flow is restricted. Mm. So they may be able to do it, but it's a bit difficult. It's easier for them to pay the yes. So taking the same type of uh, sort of analogy, yes. approach, yes. same type of approach, uh, that's now one year. Mm. Yeah, we're talking about uh, 20 years, we're talking about 30 years. Mm. And then if you want to work out um, basically how much zakah you have to pay every year. Because mm. remember when you pay your zakah and then the amount comes down. Yes. So to work all of that out can potentially be an accounting nightmare. So to make things easier, it would be a good idea to actually pay zakah on your pension fund annually. Despite the fact that it's not compulsory, it only becomes compulsory. Certainly. Uh, when the pension fund will choose all the one. And the same basically applies to an RA, yes. retirement annuity. The only difference really is that generally a pension fund is an in-house uh, fund, whereas a retirement annuity, generally if you're a doctor and you self-employed, you work for yourself, yes. uh, but you'd also like to um, have a pension fund or have a pension that you can basically fall back on and then you like, uh, unilaterally by your own volition completely, you get a uh, RA, the same rules apply to it as well. Same rules apply. Morana, so, so we've looked at retirement funds, it's, it's a very common thing, uh, I think, within our community in the country that we have, and many other people globally. Um, we've, we've looked at fiat currency, so that's the normal cash that we look at in our bank. Um, there's also the understanding of if you're owning cattle as a farmer or trading stock as a, as a retailer. Um, the more, I'd say, modern phenomena for the last decade or so is cryptocurrencies. Now we know there's mixed views um, and fatwas on this, globally speaking, uh, but obviously in the South African context, there are Muslims that um, have invested in this type of asset. It's a virtual currency, whether you are speculating or whether you are holding it as an investment. What is the view on that from the Zakaa point of view? I think uh when we look at, we were speaking earlier on in terms of uh, zakat, and there are certain asset classes which are subject to zakat, and then there are certain asset classes which are not subject to zakat. One of the examples that we gave was fiat currency. It's no longer gold and silver, which is like a money commodity. Money, money commodity means that it serves all the purposes that our currency serve, but in and of itself, it also has a value. So they refer to it as money commodity. We've moved away from money commodity to like fiat currencies. Yes. And now we find that there's a like cryptocurrency, which is like a digital currency. Yes. So our scholars generally differ in this particular regard when it comes to uh, cryptocurrencies. Interestingly, when I'm faced with a new phenomenon, 
I like to look at the wording. Yes. You know, like the, the makeup of the construct. Cryptocurrency is a construct. So currency we're familiar with. Yes. But what does crypto mean? Yes. And in terms of the etymology of the word crypto, crypto basically means to be hidden. Yes. Uh, so crypto digital, in other words, you can't see, feel and touch it. Yes. It's not tangible. Uh, fiat money is uh, very much tangible, yes. but cryptocurrency isn't. It's encrypted, yeah. It's encrypted. Yeah. Uh, uh, my understanding is that you have this uh, also chain block technology. Correct, blockchain, yes. Blockchain technology, and then uh, there's like an encryption in there, yes. and then your ownership of cryptocurrency is represented by the digits. Then Correct. there's a ledger, and. That's right. Uh, what the scholars look at, so there was there are basically three views in terms of my very basic reading into the issue. Yes. The one would be that it's not recognized as a currency at all, yes. or as an asset. Yes. The other view um, holds that crypto is not a currency, but rather it is an asset. Yes. And the last view, uh, which seems to be the preponderant view, and which seems to be the view that makes most sense, or that accords to the reality of cryptocurrency, and that is that um, crypto currency, it's uh, well, and it's a currency. It's not an asset. It's not nothing. Yes. So people ask, but you know, you can't see, feel, and touch it. There are many phenomena that we can't see, feel, and touch. Certainly. The oxygen that we breathe, yes. um, we can't see, feel, and touch it. But is it there? Definitely it is there. And I think a proof to underscore the reality or the existence of a cryptocurrency is there's a conversion. Mm -hmm. If you want to buy cryptocurrency, what happens is you're going to pay in rands, and then those rands are converted, it's registered, and it impacts in terms of the digits that you hold. Yes. And a value is attached to that, so much so that you can uh, purchase uh, something with that, you can pay for services with that. So despite the fact that it's not tangible, it's still a, a real phenomenon. Yes. So my basic understanding of, of, of cryptocurrencies is that the very justification for fiat currencies is the same justification for for cryptocurrencies. Yes. And when we make an argument that like gold and silver, that fiat currencies are subject to zakat, yes. in the same way, um, cryptocurrencies would also be subject to zakat. Because ultimately, it's a medium of exchange. Yes. Uh, cryptocurrency is a novel medium of, a, uh, of exchange. Um, I didn't know this particular term. Uh, uh, you basically just paying for something through a uh, what's peer to peer system. I think that's the term that they right. do it. That's right. So in other words, I don't pay you directly. Yes. I purchase something from you, then I pay via an agency. Yes. That agency is called a peer to peer system, and the agency basically happens to be a cryptocurrency and the infrastructure which basically supports that. Supports that. So if you have a few uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, that is hidden somewhere, yes. <laughs> <laughs> then you will have to pay the account in terms of my understanding of all those ways. And certainly the, the conditions of that you have to be valid for a uh, one year lunar uh, calendar year, so to say, and then yeah. also ownership of it. Absolutely. Well, and, uh, we, we understand that there's a criteria of who can receive the car. Um, can, uh, I think, a very practical question. Or if, once you've calculated your zaka, you know exactly what you now need to uh, pay or distribute as a car. Can one also distribute your zaka in kind? Does it have to be monetary? Does it have to be in an asset form? Um, so, Hamad, that's also a very uh, good question. So, I have a business, and let's say uh, I buy and sell. Phones. Yes. I buy and sell phones. So I keep a certain amount of stock uh, for you. The stock may be evolving, yes. but when it comes to business, it's really the value. Sure. So you're looking at the value of it and you're paying the account date. So now I have to pay an X amount of money. Must I pay it in cash or can I take a few cell phones and basically distribute those cell phones and my zakah is considered dispensed? In terms of the Shafi school of thought, we say no. Uh, one cannot do that. Mm. When it comes to uh, business assets and stock, then you need to work out the value, and that value must be paid in uh, the currency in vogue. Yes. So we in South Africa, basically, you're going to be paying in in the rands yes. uh, and all those in those space. Look, um, uh, that's a fixed asset. Mm. It's a solid asset. Yes. Fixed asset, yes. solid asset. But now when you convert it to, to money, it becomes a liquid asset. Mm. So the, the liquidity 
of your zakat at 2.5 percent, uh, logically, is uh, to the benefit of the of the recipient. Yes. In other words, they may not need a cell phone. Mm. You know, uh, I have a spice business. The poor person might not need spice, but I'm dispensing of my zakat in the form of spice. Yes. But the universal uh, value and the medium of exchange would be money, so it should be paid in, paid in, mm-hmm. in money. There are other views in all sorts of those space, like in terms of the Hanafi school of thought, that actually permit it on condition that it's actually in the interests of the recipient. So, and the interests of the recipient. It also brings to mind another very important uh, consideration when it comes to when it comes to zakat, and in terms of the recipients, we should always be doing what is in the best interest of the recipient. Yes. Uh, and sometimes. Uh, we have our own consideration, but our consideration, the Sharia actually doesn't um, acknowledge it. For example, you say, okay, I must pay 5,000 rands. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to take this 5,000 rands and I'm going to buy groceries yes. and I'm going to distribute the grocery parcels. That is not permissible within the Shafi school of food. You cannot do this, not permissible. Mm-hmm. Why? Because the right of the poor person is to the 5,000 rands. Yes. So when you take the 5,000 rands and you purchase groceries therefrom, then you are administering wealth that doesn't belong to you. Mm-hmm. And that is not, not correct. The only time you can do it is when you secure the permission or agency from the recipient and they um, they uh, they permit you to actually, to, to actually do that. So that's mm-hmm. another uh, consideration which comes to, which comes to mind. Another further consideration, if it's possible, so this is also, I think, a beautiful thing. Um, yes, Alhamdulillah, by the grace and mercy of Allah SWT, we have many zakah um, and uh, zakah institutions that validly um, collect your zakah and they uh, redistribute your zakah. Yeah. Uh, what is also nice to do would be that, you know, to keep your zakah local as well. Mm-hmm. Um, a portion you, you know, give to the agencies that will basically see that your zakah reaches far and wide. But it's also a good practice for you and your family to take your zakat. Look within your family first yes. in terms of this, if somebody's needy, because um, as long as you're not responsible for that person's maintenance and upkeep, mm-hmm. then it is valid for you to give that person zakat. And the Prophet also would say that that zakat is uh, further reaching. Further reaching in what sense is it holds a greater reward. One is the reward of dispensing your zakat, and number two is for maintaining family ties. So from an Islamic perspective, um, that would be highly encouraged to actually take your zakat and look first within your uh, immediate or extended family mm-hmm. and see if there's a person in need and give uh, him or her your zakat. Mm-hmm. So much to discuss on this topic, Mohan. Well, <laughs> Shukran for, for well, your well, time. Well, I'll reward you for that. Well, if it's, um, yeah, I mean, I hope, I hope that uh, the viewers have benefited from the two part series that we've had on zakat and it will be helpful for you in calculating your zakat and how to practically deal with it from your end. Uh, until next time, Ya Manila, Shukran, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.